and welcome to <laughs> Theology Unleashed, the channel where Eastern theology meets Western skepticism. Today I've got another interfaith discussion, uh, not that one, this one, with uh, Joshua Ryan Farris, who's a Christian scholar. He's done a lot of work on atonement theories, and we'll be discussing uh, atonement theories and seeing whether one of them is logically coherent. So, Josh, thanks for coming on. Hey, it's good to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. So do you want to start by explaining what atonement theories are? What, 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 do they, what do they do? What do they talk about? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, I, I think you invited me on to chat about the atonement and then enter into uh, some interfaith discussion about the nature of uh, God and his goodness to his creation and those sorts of things. So um, let, me, let me just preface um, some of my thoughts about the atonement, um, some of the guiding assumptions that I'm kind of coming at it with and working with. Um, I'm, I, I am assuming one philosophical assumption for sure, the law of non-contradiction, and then, um, of course, from there, uh, uh, fundamentally, some sort of authority view of the, uh, the scriptures as they are, um, or as they have been handed down to us from the greater ecumenical Catholic Church, uh, uh, at a minimum, the Protestant canon, and then maybe even more than that, the Apocrypha. But um, the lesser authorities that I have been working with when I talk about the atonement, it, uh, I've been working within uh, sort of the, the, the broader dogmatic teaching of the conciliar church, the conciliar ecumenical church that are expressed in, in the sort of conciliar and creedal statements uh, that we have um, uh, probably up into the seventh ecumenical council. And so those provide at least at a minimum higher uh, interpretive authorities than other interpreters, say philosophers of religion today, say my local pastor, uh, they provide an interpretive lens for understanding the Bible itself. And so uh, there's two really central ideas that give the sort of frame or the, the sort of the form for how it is that I, uh, as a Christian, and I think the broader Christian church really comes at the atonement. There is no uh, creedal or definitive sort of ecumenical statement about the atonement. Um, some Baptist and uh, reform types might uh, suggest otherwise, but that's a whole nother discussion that I'm sure we can get into as we talk more about the nature of sectarianism and such that sort of thing. But there is no centralized um, dogma, core dogma. There is no statement on the atonement. That so that makes it a little more difficult to narrow down precisely this is what the atonement does. And so let me, I probably should have started off with the definition of the atonement, but atonement just means um, at, at one minute, um, the idea is that there is some sort of breach, either an objective breach, as some theologians like to say, or subjective breach between uh, uh, God and his human creation in particular, and uh, some sort of remedy needs to be made in order to uh, solve that dilemma or that problem, that, that fundamental human problem as a result of human corruption or sin. And uh, Christ uh, brings about some sort of atonement in order to bring about a kind of unity that humans can once again have with God so they can be reconciled back to God where they were formerly um, in a kind of a breached relationship, where there's a kind of violation of a covenant or a contract or something like that. He uh, reestablishes or reaffirms that covenant relationship between human beings and, and God. Um, so these central ideas, let me get back to that. There's these organizing central ideas for the atonement. And these are pretty crucial for how it is that uh, most throughout church history have thought about the atonement, and I think they're nearly fundamental uh, organizing motifs for how we as Christians think about the atonement. And those would include uh, the doctrine of the incarnation. And so we can think about the doctrine of the incarnation as uh, the second person of the Trinity, uh, uh, the second person of God himself, who becomes incarnate. In other words, he becomes flesh. He becomes and takes on a human form. Uh, historically, that means that he takes on a full human nature, so he bears or instantiates all the properties that are necessary or sufficient to being a human uh, in order that he might save us, according to uh, Anselm's Cure Deus Homo. Why did God become man? Well, he did so so that he could make atonement and so that he could 
bring us back to God in a sort of unitive, unitive relationship. And so the incarnation is central not only to um, how it is that God himself reveals who he is by nature, by his character and relationship to creation, but also more importantly, um, uh, uh, it is a revelation of how God saves humanity or reconciles humanity and uh, the end for which humanity was created. And so we see in John 1, 1, that uh, the Logos referring to Christ became, uh, 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 was, was, in, uh, was one with the Father from eternity, and he took on flesh according to John 1, 18, and he was the perfect representation of uh, God's invisible nature according to Colossians 1, 15 and Hebrews 1, 3. The second thing is the resurrection. And so this, um, the resurrection becomes a, an important organizing central idea for all of Christian thinking insofar as Christ is um, the one who uh, is not only the divine human being who reveals God perfectly to us and lives on the earth a perfect life, but upon death and giving himself up as a sacrifice, he is as the Nicene Creed puts it, raised from the dead. He is resurrected from the dead. And this is the real um, final hope, you might say, of the Christian believer, whereas uh, sort of a vision of God, a union with God um, by way of the soul is the initial hope of the believer. The resurrection, the final resurrection, is the final hope of the believer. That's what we long for. We long to be in an embodied state ultimately. And so the atonement, has something to say to that and the resurrection certainly has some sort of informing capacity when we think about what it is um, that the atonement is actually doing and what its end goal is to do what it's um, uh, designed to do so those uh, two ideas those central ideas become uh, pretty um, significant to how it is that we think about the atonement how it is that we then begin to articulate a doctrine of the atonement and how it is that we begin to think about the very nature of what uh, theologians might call the mechanism of the atonement itself and what it is that the atonement is doing to save humanity or what it is that Christ is doing to save humanity. Um, so these are nearly fundamental beliefs or maybe fundamental beliefs within a, at least within a Christian theological frame. Um, and they serve to be uh, pretty fundamental. So, if uh, um, we're coming at it from a different perspective, we'd have to really look at those doctrines and criticize those as well. Um, but uh, here's some things that um, I think all Christians sort of take for granted. These are sort of the basic ideas. Maybe if I can jump into that, uh, the basic ideas that make sense of the atonement. Um, <clears throat> should I begin there, or, or, or do you want to follow up with a question um, on that? So the two ideas are one that there's something that needs to be restored or repaired in the relationship with God or in the conditioned souls, and the other idea is that Jesus did something with that regard. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's that's the um, uh, that's the fundamental story of the gospel, whereby um, God became man, He lived amongst us, He perfectly revealed God, and He saved us from our our corruption. Yeah. Uh, uh, unto some kind of eternal life. By that, resurrection is meant. So, I mean, I could just give a little bit of context from the, the Hare Krishna, which is, you know, an, an Eastern theological perspective. Um, the description we hear in Bhagavatam of what it is that needs restoring and how it's restored is a little different. So it's the soul is considered always pure, and what's happened is we've become covered over with bad qualities with with this dirt in the heart and the process of salvation is the process of cleaning the heart and that happens on an individual basis and uh it happens through coming in contact with god god's devotees god's holy name hearing god's messages and all of these things are like getting in the shower and cleaning off the heart good yeah 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 so you certainly see that sort of metaphor in scripture and in in the church tradition as well, there is a kind of um, cleansing. Obviously, the the sort of the metaphor of baptism is a, is um, well, it's not just a metaphor, but it's um, it's a reality that's described in the Old Testament when we see the um, the um, 
the washings, the priestly washings, which become sort of tip, tip, uh, typological for the New Testament baptism washing, washing of all the saints, the priesthood of all believers. And so um, there is certainly that cleansing metaphor. There is something going on whereby um, there is a Holy Spirit work. There's a spirit work that is signified in the waters of baptism that um, follows from the atonement in, in making um, us right with God in, in, in and through cleansing. Uh, um, I, so you have that, that metaphor. Uh, another yeah. thing I, I could say for context, so there's one uh, Hare Krishna scholar. He's not a Christian scholar and hasn't done extensive amounts of homework on this, but he has this theory that uh, atonement theories are born out of trying to rationalize the expectations of the Messiah not being met. So people prior to Christ appearing were expecting a military revolution. They were expecting the Messiah to come and lead a military revolution and overthrow the corrupt rulers and restore the kingdom um, for the Jews. And Jesus didn't do that. And Jesus dying on the cross was <laughs> a pretty, like the epitome of that not happening, you could say. Um, so they they um, came up with a story to, to tell themselves, to be convinced that, oh, no, actually, this is all part of it. Uh, Jesus did something really special on the cross. He was a sacrificial lamb. And uh, this is why... Uh, the, some, of, some of the versions or some of the theories go that he Jesus died either the day before or the day after. What's that special Christian occasion? Passover? Where you sacrifice, oh, traditionally yeah. they would so, sacrifice a lamb. So uh, the, the theory is, you know, one of them was like, let's just say he died on that day and then he was the sacrificial lamb. And um, of course, that is not to attribute any ill motives to them. I'm sure they were all believing what they were saying, but I, I, you can quickly respond to that if you like. I'm not arguing for this theory. I'm just putting it on the table as one idea. Hmm. Yeah, so um, it, the idea is that... Um, uh, so the central idea, let me make sure I understand. The central idea that uh, is after is that he died um, not immediately upon the cross, but he died later. And so that was what sufficiently made atonement. Uh, the idea I'm presenting is that atonement theories were an at a, a rationalization in order to try to explain that Jesus dying on the cross was something super special in order to satisfy everyone's unmet expectations by coming up with a big story of how this was actually a really big thing rather than a disappointment. Oh, 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 I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of, um, do people make that yeah, argument I mean, in the literature? Yeah, I mean, so that's common in the, the, the literature on certainly the, the, the resurrection, the resurrection literature and uh, offering up alternative theories of, of what was actually taking place in, uh, with uh, the early Christians um, as they responded to, the, um, uh, to the, the events of Christ that they were not expecting, that this was a kind of subjective um, way to uh, satisfy um, their... Um, their understanding of, of, of Christ's death, which was quite disappointing, um, and and uh, portrayed God as a rather weak person rather than rather than the strong man who's the king who came to rule. So you have you do have these, and and these are ways of um, articulating uh, uh, what what may have been going on that actually did not take place. Or actually did not occur um, but um, I don't see I don't see anyone actually um, defending that I, I don't I don't I don't really take I guess I don't really understand the um, the weight of that sort of uh, uh, sort of theory uh, I, I, I guess uh, so well, that's you, not something you could accuse it of committing the genetic fallacy yeah. Uh, you know, I guess it, it could be committing the fallacy of arguing that an idea is false because the motivations or the reasons or the way somebody arrived at it was not sound. Right, right. Um, right. So am I correct in thinking that atonement theories are basically theories of what Jesus did on the cross? Or are there some that have nothing to do with the cross? Or 
Yeah, so there are a variety of uh, theories um, that take the atonement to, to be more of a um, holistic concept of, of Christ's uh, active and passive obedience. Um, this is uh, one of the sort of the background beliefs uh, for uh, developing the atonement. Commonly, Christians affirm that Christ became a curse for us, right? Galatians 3.13, so that, um, so that he could become or put up the ultimate sacrifice for us. And there's a variety of different ways we can talk about sacrifice. Um, I do think that um, sacrifice is a pretty um, central metaphor specifically to the atonement and how we define the atonement. So that's an important um, sort of background assumption about what the atonement is doing. Um, and then uh, furthermore, uh, there's this belief that uh, Christ fully reveals God. He's the son man, uh, the, the, the divine human being. But he's also the one who is both actively and passively obedient to the Father. So while on the earth, according to the Gospel of John, it's very clear that his mission was to come to glorify God and to bring honor to God in his active obedience in his life. And then also up on the cross when he, when he gave himself up as the ultimate sacrifice, according to, to, um, to uh, Hebrews. <clears throat> but, um, and we see this also in uh, Romans 5, 6. Uh, Christ became sin for us so that Christ died for the ungodly. So this becomes a, a pretty important idea. So the idea is that he became corruption for us or he became a curse for us, depending on how you interpret that in Scripture, so that he could die for the ungodly. And he does die for the ungodly in Romans 5, 6. Um, so he does something that uh, is um, uh, arguably impossible for other persons with, uh, who are not divine human beings to do. But this, so there's this, there's this important idea that I think is, the, the, that's part of the background of the atonement. He becomes a curse for us. He assumes our curse, and then he also dies on our behalf in our place for the ungodly. And so, uh, at least, uh, particularly as it's picked up in, um, uh, I would say, the medieval tradition, but especially in the Reformed tradition, this idea or this notion of substitution becomes pretty important to how uh, uh, many later Christians develop the doctrine of the atonement. And um, uh, whether we're talking about him as a global or local substitute, there is, uh, there is this clear, it seems, um, impressive notion about his uh, salvific work as being substitutionary in nature. He substitutes himself as the perfect sacrifice on our behalf and in our place so that we might um, be united back to God. And so that we might have peace with God, according to Romans 5.1. So that we might have peace with God and be in un union with God. Uh, so that's the goal. Um, and what he does is substitutionary in nature insofar as he assumes our bad, uh, our bad state, the curse, as it's called in the Old Testament. And then he dies for us as the perfect sacrifice. And so those... Assuming our curse, the curse that was on Israel, and then um, uh, uh, substituting in our place as the the one who died in our in our place, so that we didn't have to. Um, so we can get into probably one of the most popular, prominent, and also the most criticized theories: penal substitution. In a minute, um, but first, I've got a clip from Matt Dillahunty that um, Slam RN kindly sent me, and uh, we can. Uh, hear some of his skepticism towards it. Uh, I'm hoping all the sound and everything's going to work. Oh, hang Good. on. I got to unmute I hope it. So. <laughs> hang on. Uh -huh. I had it muted. Okay, unmute. Started on the absurdity of of blood sacrifice. I mean, substitutional atonement is absurd enough on its own. And then when you add in that it, this particular type of substitutional atonement it isn't one where, you know, she owes you five bucks, but I'm going to pay it off for her. Um, or she, she got a speeding ticket, and, and I'm going to do the jail time for yeah. her or whatever. It's one of, uh, she's who she is, uh, so we're going to kill somebody or something right. for it. So we're going to take somebody. Mm, the smell of blood just really, mm. ah, yummy. That's, that's the way. I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm only 
kind of slightly exaggerating. It, it's right there in the Bible where the smell of the blood sacrifice was pleasing to the nostrils of God. Get some new nostrils, you sick bastard. That's just crazy. Yeah, and I just, I, I think, you know, I can, I can understand how people would, especially in the times when, when we didn't understand the world to the degree. That's probably enough. I didn't screen this clip, so I'm not sure exactly where they go with it. Um, there was another. There's there's another one I've heard before. Maybe that that wasn't quite the one I was looking for, but you get some idea from that. Um, so, do you want to explain what penal substitution is? Would, would you agree with any of Matt Dil Dilhunty's criticism of penal substitution theory there, or you want to push back on that first? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me explain what it is first, and then we can talk about his comments and and what I think about penal substitution and its merits. Can you tell me, Matt Delahunte, I've heard of him before. Who, who is he? Uh, uh, he's a, a really famous atheist skeptic. He, he's behind, uh, uh, yeah. prominent on the Atheist Experience show. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've heard him before. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, I just wanted the context there. I don't think so, he comes up in the, in the philosophical literature. He, what's that? I don't think you'll find him in the literature. No, no, I don't think so. No, and I haven't read him in the literature. Um, so, um, yeah, let me say this. Um, so penal substitution. So in penal substitution, there are, and there's a lot of literature on this right now. In fact, there's a lot of literature trying to clarify what people mean by penal substitution as a broad family of views. So it's taken to be a, a sort of broad family of views or uh, a sort of, view that has a core set of ideas that are worked out in different ways. And so William Lane Craig, um, probably his book, Defending Penal Substitution, is the most prominent defense of penal substitution right now today in the global academic scene. It's gotten a lot of attention. Um, and um, I would say that bare bones penal substitution includes these, well, these two ideas as they're conjoined specifically together. And that is, one is substitutionary, as I described earlier, um, but also penal. There is something about the substitutionary nature of Christ's work on the cross, his death on the cross, that is, um, that is penal in nature. When he takes on the curse, that is uh, taken to mean, or at least include, the meaning that he is taking upon this sort of debt, this debt of humanity. Uh, the debt that is um, is rightfully ours as covenant violators or violators of God's moral law. And so as violators of the covenant or God's moral law, Christ assumes that role by taking on our curse for us, and he dies for us in our place and on our behalf. Both representation and substitution are present accordingly, and uh, in so doing, the debt that is owed, um, the debt that is owed to us, um, Christ takes in our place. He does it for us. Um, so, um, so that's the idea of penal substitution. There's lots of different ways to work that out, and ways, at least today, that some are working it out that don't seem to really be penal substitution um, anymore. But we can talk about that more. But so here's the clear ideas. Let me be as crystal clear as possible. I think these are the core constituent ideas of penal substitution. One, Christ's atonement is necessary for his full redemptive work. In order to make full salvation for humanity, for a all of humanity or for a select few of humanity, Christ's atonement is necessary. Um, two, Christ dies as a substitute for individual human beings. He dies as a substitute for um, for individual human beings. Um, and that's the, um, that's the second one. Third, Christ dies in order to, and this one might be debatable, although I think arguably it's right, Christ dies to absorb the penal consequences of divine justice and wrath that is brought about by humanity's sin or corruption. So he absorbs that to himself, and this is where he becomes the substitution on our behalf for this particular debt that we have. So Christ pays the debt of punishment, and Christ's death is a vicarious sacrifice that is effective for us. His substitutionary work of death 
in taking our debt of punishment in death is effective to make um, uh, restitution, you might say. So this would be a, product, a part of a broader set of theories called restitution theories. And this, I think, is prominent in the broader reform tradition. And I, I would argue even in the, 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 um, the Roman Catholic tradition as it was later developed, uh, that restitution becomes um, the primary lens in which we think about or see Christ's uh, uh, making of atonement in his life and death. So there is some kind of restitution that needs to be made. There is a debt that we accrue because of our actions, because of our corruption or what have you. And Christ needs to do something to solve that debt, to make restitution. So that's the fundamental idea, I think. And so in penal substitution, it takes on a kind of a different character insofar as the debt that Christ makes or takes to himself is a debt of punishment, not simple debts. So that's to be distinguished from, say, an Anselmian satisfaction theory or Thomistic satisfaction theory, where Christ can uh, take to himself simple debts that effectively eliminate the debt of punishment that would otherwise be um, brought on human beings. So that's the idea of penal substitution. I hope that makes some sense. Um. So you explained a couple other theories too. Uh, um, restitution theory is, is a different one when you were contrasting it. Is that right? Yeah, so restitution. So I, I'm seeing restitution as a broader category to cover, say, theories like penal substitution and Anselmian satisfaction. Um, it's a broader category insofar as there is some debt that needs to be satisfied, and that debt that needs to be satisfied is um, done by way of making uh, uh, restitution, in other words. And so penal substitution would be one um, set of theories that would fall under restitution. It effectively restores something that's been lost or restores something that has been lost or stolen from the owner. And the owner, this would be the case, um, the owner would either be God or the moral law. And it's a recompense for, for the injury or loss made to either a person or impersonally to the moral law. And I think that's an important dis discussion that is now being discussed in the literature by penal substitution advocates. Um, so restitution would be a broader category. So restitution and penal substitution seem to be have a, a, enough in common that they could also occupy an even broader category. Because another theory you have is uh, moral influence theory, or from the from, use Harry Christian lingo, bhakti influence theory. Uh, bhakti is dev devotion to God, so uh, bhakti influences an a action which is didactic, or teaches a lesson, or sets an example that helps other people learn to develop bhakti themselves. Or uh, moral influence it teaches people, you know, that by seeing Christ's example of of displaying God-like qualities or displaying um, you know, the, the qualities that a Christian should imbibe and it inspires us to, to become nice Christians to, to dedicate our lives to God. That, that, that would be a, another category in contrast to both penal substitution and restitution theories. Yeah, yeah. So that would be a different theory altogether. I think, um, I, I, I mean, there might be ways of articulating moral influence as a kind of global substitution, maybe. I honestly haven't seen many people develop moral influence theories in the, in, in the contemporary Christian discourse. Um, I think there are ways to beef it up and make it a little bit more substantive. I find moral influence theories um, less than fully compelling for uh, several reasons. I guess some of One those reasons is, are biblical uh, and theological in nature. Well, maybe I, I would are. say, I would say, yes. Yeah, so they would be biblical. Um, insofar as um, I think the biblical text uh, teaches or yields something a bit more uh, robust and inclined toward um, some sort of substitution, as I've described it, that is um, at least in application, um, Christ becomes a local substitute um, for individual humans uh, in, 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 in providing a sort of satisfaction for uh, individual human corruption or sin. 
Um, I think the moral influence theory itself has been characterized in history as being um, a theory that is reflective of a kind of Pelagianism. And so Pelagianism is something that um, in the Council of Orange has been repudiated as, as, as heretical, a heretical, not only a heretical view of, of, of humanity, humanity primarily because of, um, um, uh, but uh, a heretical view of, of God's relationship to humanity in, in terms of how humanity interacts with God in salvation. Um, moral influence theory uh, suffers, it seems to me, from a problem of not being able to provide an actual solution, an effective solution for um, a debt problem or an objective problem. If there is such an objective problem for human beings, uh, it's hard to see how the moral influence does anything beyond, um, well, there's this mere exemplar, this man, and he, he did perfect acts. And if we kind of imitate him, then we too can become perfect at, through some sort of long process, arduous process of developing the internal virtues or something like that. Well, if that's the case, then at least Christ isn't really doing anything that effectively makes salvation for uh, human beings globally and individually, or at least uh, I, I don't see how he is. So there would be biblical concerns as well as theological concerns that uh, would lead me away from a sort of moral influence theory, particularly as it, as it seems to run into this problem of Christ doesn't really do anything. We're still doing salvation ourselves. It's still solely dependent upon me to provide my own salvation. And I think that's, that's a concern that Christians have had. I lost you. I had my mute on. Um, with regard to who's doing the salvation, um, like it's described in Bhagavatam that it's Krishna who cleans the heart. So Krishna is our, our, our name for God. God's the one who cleans the heart and he does so for someone who's developed the urge to hear his messages. So when, when we're, we situate ourselves in a particular way, then God does the work of cleaning our heart, but it's still God who does it. It's not Calvinism though, because it's that there's something about us that we're placing ourselves in order to receive that mercy. Um, you can't go too far the other way and God doing everything. Otherwise, you get divine fiat capriciously choosing who is and isn't saved. Right. Well, I mean, so I think that's right. So there, there is one strand that we've been particularly critical of in penal substitution that sort of reflects what you were just describing. The sort of gross um, characterizations of a capricious God. And I think, um, I think this is something that you've talked about before in some of your other episodes that I think you've pressed on that I think is, I think is, has some, so it's fair. I think it has some, um, some bite to it insofar as, um, there's this theory. I remember when I was in seminary, uh, hearing this theory, it became quite prominent actually in preaching and it's still quite prominent today. Um, and, um, my co-author and I called it the Christus Odium Theory, using a bit of Latin to, to kind of um, pique people's interest. Everything sounds better when you, when you put a Latin term to it, to it right? Um, it sounds a bit more sophisticated. So uh, anyway, so Christus Odium is the idea that um, the penal debt is actually identified with um, divine hatred being poured out on the sun. And so this um, divine hatred is really what is directed at human beings because of their sin and corruption. But because Christ is the substitute, he assumes that debt of punishment, namely the divine hatred that is directed at human beings because of their wickedness. Um, and Christ steps in the place of that divine hatred and takes their place for them. And he absorbs that divine hatred um, and all its its magnificent um, terribleness and that is what effectively makes atonement for human beings and so this is something that um, we've seen it's 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 a kind of an exaggerated version of penal substitution 
and it's become something that has sort of taken on uh, hands and feet in contemporary evangelicalism and, and uh, neo-Calvinism. I mean, you still see preachers today like David Platt preaching from the pulpit. The logic is very simple, and I agree with them. Like, um, God hates you. Christ steps in the place. He takes on the Father's hatred. Therefore, by so doing, he absorbs your debt of punishment so you don't have to, and you're saved as a result. And so that, um, I think, um, I think that does sort of reflect some of the uh, the problems you were uh, just alluding to and you've alluded to in the past in some of your shows about this sort of capricious, vindictive God who um, vents his anger out on the sun. Um, I think that uh, uh, there, there, certainly, there certainly are those permutations within um, uh, how some in the tradition have developed the theory. And there are certainly those permutations in contemporary preaching today where preachers have become the sort of the new authorities on, on, on um, doctrine. Um, and I think that's a real problem. Uh, mute. I think you're on mute. So there's some different metaphysical assumptions coming from the different traditions or maybe even from the different atonement theories, which we can perhaps get into a bit later. Um, so I, I did find, I found a meme which is, is relevant. Um, I'll quickly pull that up, which is, knock, knock, who's there? It's Jesus, let me in. Why? I have to save you. From what? From what I'm going to do to you if you don't let me in. Or another one, it's an atheist t-shirt, which you can buy from this website. Because uh, uh, the idea of God sending himself to sacrifice himself to himself to save us from himself is a little bit much for any logical person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's funny. I, I think there's some truth in that. And so um, I think there, there could be some truth in that with respect to some of the theories of the atonement, what, they, what they're doing. Um, if you take it that, um, say, for, for example, the way that, and we haven't gotten into my theory yet, but um, just following a little bit more of Anselm's um, satisfaction theory, which I take to be broadly substitutionary, and later developments of Anselm were certainly more um, substitutionary in nature. I would take it that we need to make a distinction between um, the moral law as a real thing that's, that God sets up as a part of the mechanism for governing the universe, the whole world, as a way to, um, to uh, govern things. So what's really significant is how it is that the that the moral government is upheld and maintained and sustained kind of analogously to the way that a king of, uh, of a monarchy would would govern his serfs and his people so that there is order and that order brings about honor to the king when things are done orderly and well and and beautifully well that brings honor to the king and so the moral law is the kind of mechanism that is real it's not some fiction but it's a real thing or a real mechanism or standard by which God uh, governs the whole of the universe. So when we violate the moral law, we're actually um, accruing a debt to the moral law. But I think we need to make a distinction between the moral law and the moral law giver in, in, insofar as what we're directly violating and dishonoring is the moral law in the moral government that God has set up and um, indirectly God himself. So there's a distinction there that I think is a really important distinction that we see in Anselm, St. Anselm, and I think it can be made from the scriptures um, for a view of substitutionary atonement that begins to look different than, say, the Christosodium that I just described, that sort of gross view that God sort of hates humanity, so he, he hates Christ, and by hating Christ and venting, he can save humanity, right? So um, there might be a way to sort of disentangle that sort of picture from from other substitutionary atonement views. Right, yeah, that sort so of... The, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. That go sort ahead. of touches yeah. on an objection which I was going to put forward, which is a lot of these ideas seem to uh, uh, entail God 
sort of being angry and wanting to beat somebody up and you know jesus comes along and it's like no no like i'll be your punching bag and save everybody else just beat me up and it, it kind of seems like uh god's in need of a few 12-step programs to deal with his <laughs> anger issues rather than god being a being full of all good qualities yeah so i i think i i i i do think I do resonate with that picture, especially when we think about um, more of the the sort of exaggerated sort of penal substitution options, like I just described about the sort of Christosodian view. Um, I think that's interesting. I think um, I think uh, I think I think we either on penal substitution, as I would define it. Um, without the sort of gross exaggerations of the Christosodium or on more of an Anselmian satisfaction theory, I think I would say that the picture needs to be sort of shaped and colored more by um, merit and demerit that is, um, that is judged or determined by a particular standard uh, rather than um, uh, sort of shaping our, or coloring our picture directly from this sort of um, malef- uh, maleficent, um, arbitrary, capricious, uh, personal entity. That's, that's another question about how we, how we talk about God as being a personal being or an all-personal being. And so there's a lot of literature about that as well, but we don't have to go there. But I think, I think, I think it's important to make this distinction that... Um, that if we think about um, the corruption that man and um, that man does, uh, human beings do, in disobeying the law, they are accruing what occurs as a, a logical or natural debt, uh, uh, as a consequence, a necessary consequence of their actions. And so, and I, I, I mean, as a Westerner, maybe this is an Easterner, but I find that very intuitive that there is some sort of lawful mechanism or law-like mechanism that is judged by a certain particular standard of morality, that when I violate those moral standards, that there is some sort of debt that I accrue um, and I have to do something to make reparation for it, or uh, by reparation, I mean by, by actually repairing the debt in some way, I have to do some sort of penance, um, apology at a minimum, for my wrongdoing, I can't just haphazardly like it, it's okay, you know, all's good, you know. Um, if I steal from somebody, or if I violate someone's honor by lying about them, or if I curse someone's honor, um, I have to do something to repair for it. Maybe an apology at a minimum. Um, something, nonetheless, is required of me that needs to be taken from me in order to make reparation for the wrongful doing that I did. That seems very intuitive to me, and it seems to be how the lay of the land is uh, functions. Um, and it functions in that way across different governmental systems. Uh, it just seems properly basic, you might say, to how it is that humans interact with one another and how it is that uh, humans flourish if um, if we don't have these sort of laws that are reflective or representative of, of, of objective standards, then we can't really have a fully functioning society. If we don't have an understanding, say, of property um, as a real thing that people own, and you can't just steal from somebody else, then we um, we then then we can't have a really fully functioning or orderly society. So I think we have something similar in the Hare Krishna tradition and with the idea of karma, that uh, there's reactions to every action. Some are good, some are bad. And uh, these these are kind of mechanistic. It's, it's kind of like a law of physics, like energy can't be created or destroyed and actions have certain consequences which have to be lived out. Um, and there's also an idea of karma being destroyed. But um, so one direction I could take this is with objections is it seems um so if you have you know say your son you know a son 
goes up, gets into trouble, collects a whole lot of debt. And the father decides, okay, you know, my son was young. He was stupid. I'm going to forgive him. I'm going to help him get his life back on the road. I don't want him to have any consequences from all this trouble he got. In order for the father to do that, the father has to go to the people that the son owes money to and pay off the debt because these are third parties. And he can't just say, oh, I've forgiven you from your debt. It's like, well, no, these people are owed money. They need their money paid back to them. So somebody has to pay that money. But what you have in this in this example is a third party. Whereas uh, with God, uh, we we have this idea that God is the sum and substance of everything. Everything's contained within God. And if there is any kind of moral law, it's going to be subservient to God. So the idea that that God would have to go around paying off all the debts to his own system, it, it, the, I think the logic breaks down. I think there's a disanalogy uh, that, that God would be different. You know, if, if I... If if I'm like uh, we could give an example of a bartender, right? Say say I own the bar and you have a tab and you owe me a bunch of money and I decide I'm going to forgive you. I don't need to go to my bank, pull out some money and redeposit it back into the bank. I just absorb the debt and forget about it. I just the, the debt debt just becomes zero. It's, it, it disappears. And the, with taking the analogy to God, uh, say if I as the bar owner absorb the debt of of your unpaid tab um i i am worse off financially as a result but if god does that he has an unlimited bank account so to speak that there's no loss so god could just say forgive so we have this idea in the Hare krishna tradition that just once chanting Hare krishna uh purely or without offense destroys more sinful activity than you could possibly commit destroys the karmic reactions from more sinful activities than you could possibly ever commit and that's just from coming in contact with god's holy name so there's there's some different metaphysics there uh but i raised some logical problems too i think mm -hmm. so uh i think yeah, so there, there's there's several different ways you can approach that depending on your metaphysics. I mean, if we go back to the uh, to an earlier metaphysic, um, uh, to the uh, the early uh, church fathers and what they were kind of doing with the atonement, there's a common view that penal substitution is just part of the um, early church fathers' teaching. And there's certainly places where they use language that sounds like substitution in the way we're talking about. There's certainly language that uh, describes um, the uh, debt in a kind of penal way, and um, but uh, but what most contemporary interpreters don't understand is 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 the um, the metaphysical language or the metaphysics that's, that's standing behind that and what's required and why it is that <clears throat> Athanasius goes on about the fact that uh, Christ is a divine human being. Um, there is something sort of deficient in humanity insofar as um, when they are corrupt, that they cannot be united with God. And so um, uh, there, there's, there's a sense in which um, he must be both divine and human in order to make this sort of, um, this sort of uh, atonement uh, so that, that human beings can be um, made whole again. So there's a, there's a at least a uh, a metaphysical import that um, something needs to be made whole about us um, so that we can be in union with God, so that that we can have this union uni united relationship with God. Um, so I think in the case of um, you know the uh, you, I, I'm trying to remember the analogy exactly used the store owner. Um, taking something from the store owner that's not actually yours, right? Um, I think uh, I think uh, we would say some. We would say that uh, that um, uh, something would be rightfully owed back to the store owner if, in fact, uh, that store owner owned that property. That was that was his. Something would have to be restored to him. Um, uh, um, could could the, the I guess the question is could um, God acting um, 
as the kind of store owner analogously could he just absorb that debt is that is that the idea yeah yeah the idea is god could absorb the debt and god is infinitely wealthy carrying the analogy over so there's actually no loss so a regular store owner if they absorb the debt they they're financially in a worse off position but if god absorbs a debt there's there's no material difference for him right so i i think that's right so that fits with um a sort of perfect being understanding of who god is following sort of anselm um anselm in his proslagion he says you are merciful simply because you are completely and supremely good there is no actual loss to god in this case So uh, what he's actually doing is an overflow of his supreme goodness toward his human creatures. There is a debt, arguably, that is objective, that he is satisfying on our behalf that needs to be or must be satisfied so that, um, so that we can be restored or reconciled and restored to him. But it's not something that when we steal or when we violate the moral law and dishonor his moral government, that there is something that is actually taken from him. Because, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I think um, uh, Christians and Anselm would follow this. There's something about the nature of God in his being that he is perfectly good and he experiences no loss in being or goodness when we um, violate the moral law or dishonor the moral law. Right, but there's still this problem of, I think there's still an analogy from the bartending thing to something having to be paid off. Yeah, there is. That's right. I mean, I think uh, objectively speaking, there is, at least on our side, there is a, there is a, a debt that's accrued that if the debt is not satisfied, then that debt um, uh, will be uh, a hindrance to us um, in, in having a relationship with God. So that debt, so part of the benefits of, of Christ assuming that debt, whether it be a simple or penal debt, is that what he's doing is he's, he's removing that impediment for us on our behalf. But he's removing it. Um, so there's a couple ways to look at this. Uh, so there's objective and subjective distinctions often made in the, the sort of the atonement literature. And that atonement uh, literature is not always entirely clear what they mean by objective and subjective. So on the subjective side, you might take it that there is some sort of internal impediment in me that needs to be satisfied, right? In order for me to have these sort of emotional um, uh, ordering or the the um, the psychological ordering that 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 allows me to flourish in relationship with God. There's also a, another component, the objective component, insofar as I have violated the moral law, thereby disordering the moral government that God has designed, and that is an impediment between me and God Himself. And so that objective component needs to be satisfied in some way. So in, in, insofar as the bartender, there's a tab uh, and um, there's, a, there's a debt that we owe to the bartender. We have to actually, there has to be some way of paying off that debt in order for that impediment to be removed. Right. So maybe an analogy for that would be, I have an alcoholism problem and I have a debt that I haven't paid. So I can't, it's like saying I can't quit being an alcoholic unless somebody gives some money to the bartender. It's not enough that the bartender just says, ah, oh, you know what? He's had a hard enough time. Let's just forget about the money he owes me. And on top of that, I go to a 12-step program and get my life in order. You know, the bartender sees me get my life in order and says, yeah, I, I'm happy. He's, he's got, got off the streets, given up his alcoholism. I don't, I don't, I don't need anyone to pay me. So it's, it, th this would be an analogy, what, well, extending the analogy to continue an argument against the, what, your defense. Yeah. <clears throat> so is, I, I guess the question is, is that a sufficient analogy for, 
um, sort of the global problem. You might think of it this way. There's another analogy to bring in that would uh, uh, maybe render that insufficient as an analogy for the human corruption problem. So if we think about, and I, granted, I'm reticent to do this, but um, if you think about Al Capone and, um, you know, Al Capone, you know, the, uh, the famous gangster, yeah. mob boss. Um, so if you think about Al Capone, um, if there's a debt that's owed to Al Capone, there's something bigger than simply, okay, you have this monetary debt. I, I gave you this. I gave you a loan so that you could pay off your debt. And um, there was an expectation or a contractual agreement that at some point in time, you would pay off that debt, right? Um, well, if that um, person doesn't pay off his debt, it's um, there's something even bigger than paying off the monetary debt. There's something about the nature of Al Capone's honor that has been dishonored as a result of the debt that has been uh, not been paid. So, um, so what what occurs from that? Well, what follows from that, by consequence, would be a kind of penalty, and the penalty is well, uh, Al Capone's Guzik right hand man goes out and um, he's called the you've heard of Guzik the Guzik figure. He's the leg breaker. Right. So right. he goes out and he enacts this sort of punitive measure to um, restore moral order between um, between the, the parties in place. Right. So um, I certainly don't want to portray God as an Al Capone figure, but the, the, I think the important the important idea here is, is that there's something at stake that needs to be restored. And that is the honor. In the in the system, the moral system that that has been established, and so um, I think for uh, for Christ to do that, he has to pay, uh, or for for humanity to be to be um, to uh, to be made right with God in a way that the impediment is set aside. There are at least two components. The alcoholic needs to have some sort of psychological renewal, right? He needs to go through some sort of process whereby he uh, is no longer dependent upon the alcohol and he develops the virtue of some sort of discipline, right? So that he can experience God more fully. But then there's the objective side, I guess you might say, the objective side along the path or along the way of how he has or who he has dishonored or what he has dishonored and the systems that he has violated as a result. And so is there a satisfying component to one's atonement theory that satisfies that objective moral component of honor that brings or, or restores order back to the system, whereby the alcoholic, as a result of all of his bad actions, he has along the way, he has systematically um, undermined um, the honorable systems in place. We. Um, whereby at some points he didn't pay his tab, right? So he has that sort of character. He's treated people poorly. Maybe in his own home he's treated his family poorly. Um, he's dishonored them. Uh, he, he has become uh, uh, a moral wreck in many ways, habitually a moral wreck. And there's something both internal about what is going on in him and external that needs to be satisfied. Maybe that would be a better way to put it, an external component that needs to be satisfied in terms of the moral order and an internal component in terms of his psychological wherewithal that needs to be uh, um, reordered for salvation. Um, so the, the still seems to entail God not being full of all good qualities or you know having an anger problem or something like uh, I think yeah, drawing an analogy to Al Capone and God is problematic right off the bat because with Al Capone you have some a criminal full of bad qualities, envious, you, you know, tit for tat, I'm going to get these people back because they've dishonored me. Whereas with God, we're supposed to have a being full of all good qualities. And, and that would mean, like, uh, for some contrast, uh, there's a story in... And the Vedas of some sages, uh, some uh, yes, they're they're 
special personalities, not just ordinary humans. They were trying to figure out who's God. So there's uh, Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva. And they thought, is it Vishnu? Vishnu is another name for Krishna. Uh, is it is it Lord Brahma or is it Shiva? And so they uh, Brahaspati was given this job to go and work it out. So he, he went to Lord Shiva and didn't shake his hand. And that was a way of dishonoring him. And Shiva, Shiva got angry. <laughs> I think Shiva cursed him. Uh, mm-hmm. He went to Brahma. Or maybe it was, I can't remember what, what, what the exact, it, he did something similar with Brahma and Brahma got upset. I think he was the son of Brahma. So Brahma was his father and he dishonored his father by not addressing him by his name or maybe it was something like not shaking his hand. And then he went to Vishnu and he kicked him in the chest. He ran up to him and kicked him. And uh, Lord Vishnu replied by saying, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. My chest is so hard. I, I hope it didn't hurt your foot. And went back to the sages and they all agreed, okay, Vishnu must be God because he didn't take any offense. In fact, he, he, and he accepted your approach of him in a good way and actually apologized to you instead of getting upset. And th- this is the kind of thing God would do, whereas everyone else has an ability to become offended and get upset, but not God. I mean, God will become upset if we dishonor his devotee. Uh, this is why uh, how you, our interactions with uh, fellow devotees of God are, are so important. But um, that's kind of, that's a good quality in a sense, though, because, you know, like a really good father is going to stand up for their children and and care about how their children are treated in the world and, and so on. Um, and uh, so yeah. c- carrying on with, with one more example related to this, like, like we could... You know, rather than this example of Al Capone, who's owed a debt and sends the leg breaker around, uh, we we could have the mother who has, you know, loaned the drug addicted child some money to purchase a car and the child was supposed to pay it back. But instead, he got into trouble, developed a drug addiction, totaled the car and has no way of paying back the debt. And the mother is heartbroken. Right. But then later on, this child gets his life in order, goes through a 12 step program gets a wife and children is living happily ever after so to speak uh but it still you know doesn't have a good career and can barely pay his own bills but he's supporting his family well a, a, a loving mother who is herself well off is going to be like you know what i don't care if you pay me back it's fine i'm just so glad that you have your life in order that's all i care about and this is the kind of thing we would expect from god this that this you know that that the love of the mother for the child uh is described as the closest thing to love of God in this world. Yeah, there's a couple of <clears throat> there's a couple of things that need uh, response or clarification. Uh, yeah, so the Al Capone analogy is like all analogies breaks down somewhere, especially when we're talking about God. Um, the point was more about the external system that's been put in place. Now, whether or not we think that system in the first place is is to be morally regarded, uh, I think, is 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 one set of questions. Um, but if the system is in place, and assuming that um, God is the one who's the moral lawgiver, then you might say, well, as um, what is what is primarily offended is 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 not first God, but the moral law, right? So um, it's so we. So if you take if you take the moral government as central, that there is a moral order that God has set up, and that order needs to be um, somehow um, orderly, uh, and and people need to be sort of functioning in their right places in order for the system to function properly, in order for human beings to function and flourish in this life or in the next life, then there would uh, be some sort of breakdown if God didn't do anything to satisfy um, the moral order that he originally set up. So um, whether you're penal substitution, Anselmian, or um, you hold to this sort of moral government view, um, I think that that is the important concept that needs to be um, sort of part of the discussion, that um, it's, it's not so much that God is lost or he he has lost or he's lost something and he needs to get it back by some sort of vengeful way. It's more so that he has a, is he has an objective accounting 
And in order to meet that objective accounting, there are certain things or conditions that need to be met in order for the moral government that he's first established to be functioning properly. And if he doesn't do that, then it would be an indictment on his justice rather than the picture of him being a sort of petulant child who's vindictive. I think there is an important distinction between the moral objective order that he's established that he needs to maintain in some form or fashion um, by way of this sort of retributive logic. Retri retribution is the idea that there is a logic implicit that um, when something is um, done wrong, that there is some sort of restitution that is uh, needed to be made. Um, and so in a broader conception of justice of the world, you might say, well, uh, that broader uh, understanding of justice would be something like what, um, what we might call rectoral justice. A rectoral justice is, is, well, it's just this idea codified in the moral government that we've been kind of toying with. And that is the idea that there is a moral law that, that functions as, a, as an objective standard by which to order um, society properly so that we can function and, and flourish. And um, God, uh, in his justice, um, would need to, uh, or does something, because he is perfectly just, to, to, uh, to maintain that order, or to put mechanisms in place to maintain that order, and to restore that order. To leave that aside would be an indictment on his justice. But I think that's a different picture than him being a petulant child who needs to capriciously sort of vent his wrath on people. <laughs> right. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, what was the thing you said just before that? Yeah, I think... Um, I think there's two different conceptions or pictures that can be brought to the fore, and that is one that um, God has an objective standard that he set up in the world, and that is the, the standard by which he determines um, justice or goodness. Oh, and there's, yeah, another, there's another picture where he is this sort of petulant child who needs to vindicate himself because he's psychologically unstable. So would you say that penal substitution theory, or at least some versions of it, suffer from that problem of God being petulant? Yeah, I think so. Um, like, I, 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 I can think of an more... analogy for it. Like, you know, somebody, you know, somebody does something naughty and the father gets the belt out, like, all right, you're getting a spanking. And then the mother convinces the father, no, no, we don't, we won't spank him this time. We'll forgive him. It's okay. It's like, I've got my belt out. I'm going to spank somebody. It's like, okay, well, go and spank that rabbit. <laughs> is that, what do you think of that analogy for penal substitution? Like someone who's innocent is going to suffer because this child's been forgiven and I've already got the belt out. Somebody's got to take it. Yeah, so I, I think that's a good, I think that's a relevant point. I think, um, uh, I think that on penal substitution, at least some extreme versions or depending on how they're articulated in terms of God's relationship to humans, it does have that sort of um, color to it or shape to it insofar as it is all about God being sort of violated. And it does seem to imply that he has lost something and he better get it back. And if he doesn't get it back, then, well, he's a, He's, uh, he's kind of a weak, petty god, right? Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I do think some of the views of penal substitution and how they're articulated, especially in preaching, I mean, preachers are all about rhetoric. And, um, and the problem is when preachers start developing doctrine based upon their own rhetoric. Um, when something like a Christus Odium, where God hates sinners um, and uh, there happens to be this sort of scapegoat available. So God kind of uses that scapegoat in order to um, satisfy his own internal uh, his uh, own internal um, hole. His um, punching bag. Yeah, like a punching bag. Because um, 
Well, that that I think I think the crystal sodium view does sort of and views like it do sort of um, do sort of entail that kind of picture of God. Um, unfortunately, I think there's. Um, I was trying to find this quote from uh, David Platt. He um, he's a famous preacher here. You may have heard of him, uh, and uh, uh, he he's. Um, He's, um, he's kind of pushed this line and this logic to its uh, sort of logical conclusion in the way that we're describing here. And he says, um, uh, when we see God's holy hatred do sin and his holy judgment do sin, yes, that rests upon sin, but not as if it were outside of us. He goes, he goes on to say something like, uh, Jesus stood in our place and took it upon himself. So, um, and, and, uh, he takes upon the penalty, and he becomes the one condemned in our place. And and um, and what he means by this, he means by this, he took our holy, he took the holy hatred, the holy judgment, and the holy wrath of God, that was not just due our sin, but due to us. Quote, end quote. He took the holy hatred of the father now that 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 perfectly encapsulates i think the kind of picture um that that uh that uh i think you're describing that you have a problem with and i i i think that's um i think that's a fair criticism of that view i don't think it's fair of the whole of the christian tradition or the way that um most have described or developed their theory of the atonement um, but I, I do think it is fair of how some exaggerations of penal substitution have been developed. And I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of penal substitution. I think that it, especially in contemporary times, the way it's been developed commonly, it, it lends itself to precisely this sort of picture of God as a petulant child who has a an internal hole, a gaping hole, and he needs to punch on somebody to get his vengeance out. Yeah. Um, and I, especially the Christian sodium sort of view that's been developed and promulgated by many preachers and even contemporary theologians who are defending it, um, I think it lends itself to that sort of view. Um, um, yeah. We've probably got a, we've got about another forty minutes, and there's there's a lot of direct, different directions we can go. So probably what I'll do is just make several points all at once, and then you can reply to as many of them as you like, and then we can figure out what direction we want to go after that. So uh, back on the, so I hope this this might come across as gish galloping, but I'll give you as much time as you need. <laughs> it's it's all related to stuff we've been talking about. So uh, with the analogy of Al Capone, you said analogies always break down at some point, which is true. But I would say the analogy breaks down at, at precisely the point where it's supposed to be making its point. Um, so, you know, Al Capone is, is, is having his vengeance on you because of his bad qualities in the heart. And this is the bit that's supposed to be analogous to God needing to have some kind of restitution or substitution or the moral law has to be satisfied in some way. So I'd say the analogy is breaking down in the wrong place. So precisely where it's supposed to be doing its work is where it's breaking down. Um, and then also with the, the moral law system, um, what, one one way I could touch on that is it's, it's kind of like, so in a, a communal living situation or like at the summer camp or something, sometimes they, they there's one kid, or like, or one example is I used to listen to, listen to music all through school. I just have one earbud in, and the teachers didn't mind because I was paying attention. But then another kid would be in the class listening to music, not paying attention, and that kid gets told to take his headphones off, and the other kid's like, "Yeah, but you know, Juno's wearing his headphones. What about him?" And it's like, but he's concentrating. But you can't do that kind of thing in those situations. You have to pull the headphones out. So it's like. All right, this this brings me to another point, which is miracles. So you're talking about this, that you know, there's the laws of physics and there's the laws of of the moral system, but God can violate the laws of physics uh, when He wants to heal somebody of some crippling ailment. Uh, th th some healings occur at times which violate the laws of physics. So similarly, uh, God could surely just do something like that with 
uh, the moral laws and just say, all right, you're forgiven. <laughs> you're, let's, now, now you've got your life in order. We'll forget about all your previous karma. Uh, and yeah, so that, that was it. And uh, the third point is um, that I, I probably should have made this at the beginning when, when you mentioned that these atonement theories, are, as the, you don't have definitive answers given in the scripture. So that's kind of open to interpretation. And you can't really solve it just by saying, "Well, read the Bible and get the answer," because it's 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 about how you interpret it and uh, how you philosophize about it. Uh, so the point I want to make with regard to that is, if it's not in the Scripture, then perhaps it's not important. What is important is the stuff that's actually there in the Scripture, repeated at the beginning of the Scripture, at the end of the Scripture, and all throughout. So I, that that would be suggesting that that maybe it doesn't matter. Well, I guess it matters if you think God's evil. If you hold a belief that entails God being evil, that's probably going to hurt your ability to worship and develop your love for God. Um, but other than that, maybe it's not so important what people believe one way or another with regard to the atonement theories. Oh, you're, you're I can't hear you. Got it. Yep. Okay. Um yeah, so those, okay, so those were three points. Um, well, we could take up the third point and talk about different passages and uh, talk about, so when I made the point, I just want to, maybe we can take this discussion forward. When I made the point about Scripture not having a, um, uh, a, um, a clearly worked out theory of the atonement, uh, I wasn't saying that that um, there are no clear sort of ligaments um, that are in place in Scripture that, um, when connected, um, paint an overall picture that is sort of the most accurate picture of what Christ is doing. I wouldn't suggest that. I mean, I think that's why there's been so much work in church history about about um, uh, reflecting on thinking about uh, Christ's sacrifice, his atonement. Um, and so there's been uh, tremendous discussion throughout church history about what the meaning of scripture is on, the, on this sort of issue. Uh, I mean, I would say that when it comes to finally specifying one particular theory in all its detail, it becomes quite challenging to press that dogmatically. And that may be the reason why uh, in church history, we don't have a clearly defined ecumenical statement upon what Christ does. But that doesn't mean that there were not clearly uh, defined or clearly um, understood sort of themes or motifs that describe what Christ has done on the cross uh, in atonement. Um, so uh, I think um, I think there are some crucial scriptures that um, need to be kept in mind when we think about what Christ has done for us that that become um, central to the good news that Christ has given. Uh, the good news being um, that he is, um, you know, he, he came incarnate as uh, God, become human, and he lived a perfect life, gave himself up as a perfect sacrifice, and was raised from the dead. I think that, in short, is the good news that the scriptures proclaim constantly as the message that leads us to this kind of life this fuller life, this flourishing life that the scriptures describe. Um, so it's still important to talk about what the nature of the atonement is and what is going on in the, in the scriptures, if you take it that the scriptures are authoritative in any way. Um, so, so I don't so want to get too much into the biblical exegesis that um, I, more just logic, I just made one little point about it. So perhaps what you're saying is just because a specific atonement theory isn't fleshed out in detail and doctrinally defined historically doesn't mean uh, that we can't understand what they would have 
intended just with a little bit of uh, hermeneutics and philosophy. Uh, and it also doesn't mean it's not important because there's an overarching theme that clearly indicates atonement theories are important. Uh, and perhaps people at the time had a rough understanding of this, the particular atonement theory you think's right, therefore it wasn't necessary to articulate it in detail. Would, would that be fair? Yes, yeah, I think that's fair, yeah. Okay, cool. So if you want to reply to any of those points I made earlier, you can. Otherwise, perhaps we can talk about the uh, uh, dichotomy between justice and mercy that Christians are so big on. Yeah, yeah. So I think I can respond to the others briefly, and we can talk about it further or move on. Um, I think the... Um, I think the analogy about uh, Capone uh, is um, is to highlight more the the core conception that seems to be lost in our sort of Western egalitarian culture, and that is the conception of honor that we don't seem to have any sort of real or objective understanding of it anymore. Um, uh, if um, if honor is sort of what is central to the scriptural portrayal of God's relationship to humans, then um, I think um, then I think uh, the honor point is 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 certainly an important one um, that that needs to be highlighted more explicitly. But it's a difficult one in our age because we just don't have. We've we've given up any sort of conception of of hierarchy of of vocational place of of honor as as ha having any sort of real functioning power in how it is that societies are uh, arranged and and maintained um, and so I I think um, I think when we look at something like Psalm two. We see this more collective understanding that highlights the role of, of the king and the role that his sort of everyone else plays as honoring the king, um, and uh, it, it sort of describes. So when you see um, in Psalm two, it states that um, uh, it, it describes uh, the Lord as on his throne. He sitteth in the heavens and he laughs. Um, and it goes on to describe all the kings of the earth as being sort of functionally speaking under his authority. And um, it goes on to further describe their relationship to him as the one who is to be honored, um, the one who is the true king of the earth. So this, this whole idea of honor is, I think, what is important to and often lacking in the contemporary discussions that we have a hard time sort of um, registering with anymore. Uh, so uh, I think honor needs to be in place when we're discussing the nature of justice and the nature of mercy together. That's, I, that's what I would say. That might be a segue into the, the, uh, the next discussion right. about justice. And Do you want to say something about my miracles? analogy uh, can you remind me of the miracle oh, analogy? so I've honestly God forgotten. so if we can say the laws of physics that mean that somebody can't heal from a particular illness you know and Ill some illnesses are terminal or can't be healed according to the laws of physics um, and similarly the moral law that as you've described it uh, for, in order for there to be forgiveness or atonement or or restoration some a debt needs to be paid or something needs to occur in order to cause the restoration the um analogy would be that god can break the laws of physics to miraculously heal a person so why can't he also break the the moral laws in order to miraculously forgive somebody of their karmic debt or moral debt or whatever it is Yeah, yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah, that's a complicated question. I think, um, you know, there's the standard answers, right, of libertarian freedom, right? If um, God has created us as free beings, then he um, sort of honors the integrity of our freedom, right? I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't disagree with that. I think that's, um, I think uh, that's, that's fair. Uh, there's the other sort of, that may presume libertarian freedom. There's the other sort of response that look, well, um, there is a kind of participation that God has sort of invited us to that doesn't sort of violate our freedom, but that, um, that, uh, is sort of, it is sort of an invitation to, um, partake in the gift that he has given, the sacrificial gift that he's given in and, in and through his son, who's made atonement. Um, and that's an offer that's made to all people, all human beings. Um, as God doesn't desire for any to perish, but for all to be saved. Right? I think um, I certainly make that assumption. I think that's clear in Scripture. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, I think that um, as far as the miracle, I think, well, if you presume that um, freedom is part and parcel of the whole redemptive process, at least minimally in a sort of participation way, um, and the fact that God doesn't want to violate our freedom, I think uh, that needs to be held in the sort of the mix as we try to understand the more subjective side of salvation and how it is that God interacts with our, um, our, 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 our volition. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's some ways in which you might say, well, there, uh, there, there is some eschatological, uh, by eschatology I mean just the end of times, what happens in the afterlife. There is some agnosticism there as to what happens. So it may be the case that God does somehow reconcile all or most human beings. And um, through the means that he's provided, but we just don't see with clear eyes how that is yet. So is that kind of like saying God does miraculously violate the moral law, kind of like how he performs miracle healings, but this is the method by which he does it through, through Christ, through the I mean, I don't, resurrection. Yeah. I don't think he, I don't, I don't, I don't know. You I wouldn't call that a violation of the laws of physics, but it's, it's I mean, to carry the analogy back to miraculous healing, you could you could say something similar about how he's healing. I mean, when God miraculously heals somebody, he's not actually violating the laws of physics. He's got a particular way which he plugs into the laws of physics in order to manipulate them. And this is what he's doing with Christ. He's manipulating the moral law, but not violating it. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I would want to put it that way. I, um, I don't know that I would put it in terms of him violating some sort of lawful mechanisms that are dependent upon um, the free responses of human beings. Uh, I don't know that there's, there's reason to affirm that sort of view. I mean, um, I mean, even if you hold to a sort of compatibilist view, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that God is sort of necessarily working by way of violating certain lawful mechanisms that are dependent upon personal free, free choices of human beings. You would just say that God works in and through the volitional uh, capacities of human beings that are, that are at least on one view of compatibilism, are shaped by internal constraints within the human being themselves, and God works within those mechanisms to bring about the kind of response that he wants to bring about. I'm not an expert on, on, on free will here, but um, I think that's certainly compatible without going down the route of saying that God violates uh, or undermines these sort of moral laws and how these moral laws function with um, free human beings who have their own volitional capacity. 
I don't, I don't know how free will relates to it, because what we're talking about is like, you know, back to the analogy of the drug addicts who gets their life together and everyone's like, I'm just happy this person's got their life together. I don't care if they pay me back. I'm just happy for them. And this is the kind of thing we'd expect God to do. I'd just forgive the debt. Just just like car- the karma's gone, just snaps his finger and the karma's gone. But the Christian idea that you're presenting is more that God can't just do that. He needs to, you know, to give the bartender analogy, he needs to perform some ritual of going to his bank, pulling some money out, going back to the bank and putting the money back in again. And by that ritual, then the karmic debt is absolved. Um, so what I'm suggesting is like uh, with the healing analogy is God, when he heals an illness, he um, he just heals the illness. It's just there's no like special metaphysical thing. He doesn't have to like get a cat and transfer the illness from the human to the cat. And, you know, that, and that way he hasn't violated the laws of physics. He's just transferred the illness. He can just cure that person and the illness is just gone. So similarly, can't the karmic debt just disappear? And I, oh, I, I see. Okay, okay, I see. I think I understand. Um, yeah. So I would want to make it clear that I don't think. Um, I, I think. Um, I think God upholds the moral law as the the sort of the the means of uh, governing the universe. He has a certain particular. Um, there is a certain conception of justice of or, or rectoral justice that's that's at play here. And he, he, he's able to maintain or uphold both. There will be, at least on our side in the human realm, um, uh, honor will be maintained or restored by way of Christ's uh, work, no matter what. So such that the justice will be... Um, uh, will be satisfied. the The question is, and I think this is what you're driving to, and I'm I'm happy to go there. The question is, is that justice uh, rectoral, and and uh, in insofar as Christ satisfies that justice on our behalf, or if we so choose to violate it, or you know, just you know, whatever, we just don't want to have anything to do with Christ and what he did for us, we don't accept his revelation of God, then is it, um, is it punitive in nature? And I think that's what, I think that's the heart of what you're wanting to get at. I think justice is going to be maintained or, um, or uh, restored no matter what. It's just a question of, will it be on God's terms in so far as he's revealed himself in Christ, in Christ's work on the cross. It will be those, through those means either way, but will it be by way of each in, um, person being united to God through Christ, right, through the means that he's given, or will it be um, uh, 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 the, the alternative result of further sort of condemnation as a result of not... Um, or being unresponsive, or being um, not accepting uh, the the uh, merciful gift that's been offered through Christ's sa- sacrifice. But I think that's the question, and that's um, I think um, that's where the justice question comes in. The justice will be satisfied in one of two ways, right? I think probably that's right. In very simplistic terms, it's probably right. Yeah, I'm not so so much talking about what happens to someone who doesn't accept the mercy. I'm talking about when somebody's accepting the mercy, what's God actually doing? So the view you're defending is is God can't just forgive the debt. He's got to transfer the debt to Jesus. Oh, um, I think, yeah, so what is he doing? He's, he's, um, well, Christ looking at it from the perspective of the son, Christ is satisfying the debt, whatever that debt is. Yeah. In, in my case, I want to say it's a debt of honor rather than a penal debt. So God is honored by Jesus suffering an excruciating death on the cross. N- no, um, I think... Do you see where my question is coming law, from, though? Yeah, I think the moral law is honored. Right. And it's so, in so far as Christ gives Himself up as a perfect sacrifice, the death is 
so I take the death more generally as the, the consequence of, of him taking on the curse. But it's a general curse rather than a specific my debt of punishment, right? So there's something logically proceeding, and it's a simple debt of honor that Christ is paying because he is the perfect sacrifice. He satisfied all the conditions of righteousness or holiness. He's honored the Father in his actions and life, and he's honored him ultimately in his death. He's given up his whole life as a sacrifice for humankind in a way that we have not done and could not do, arguably. And um, it's that sacrificial death that pays ultimate homage to God that can assuage or eliminate any any punitive debt. So there has to be a reaction that takes place for God being dishonored, and that reaction taking place honors God. So, and this is done through Jesus suffering an excruciating death on the cross. So I think I think um, yeah. So I think. Um, So a few things, at least on my understanding, my view is is that the the sacrifice is a sacrifice that is precipitated by the Old Testament sacrificial system, insofar as if you understand the sacrifices that are give, being given up to God are, um, are 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 a displays of are displays of honor or glory, um, unless it, the emphasis is not on. Um, a punitive death. There is a death, and he does give himself up. There is a debt of punishment. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, there's not a debt of punishment in the strict sense. Christ is not being punished by the Father, in other words, on my view. Right, but he's he is suffering an excruciating death, and that's somehow honoring God. Well, he's suffering, yeah, well, he's, he's certainly suffering that at the hands of human beings who put him up there, right? And he's also, he's, he's, he's suffering insofar as he has, he has uh, placed himself, as the Isaiah puts it, as the suffering servant who gives himself up as a perfect sacrifice um, to honor God. So um, insofar as he gives up his whole life, which culminates in death, He's giving himself up as a perfect sacrifice um, in a um, in a way that was tip, typified in the Old Testament sacrifices, where the blood was spread and it was a uh, it was a uh, it was a sacrificial honor given to God. He himself is giving himself up as a sacrificial honor to God, but it's not a punitive act that is meted out by the Father upon the Son. Yeah, I still see a, a problem with the idea that ex- an excruciating death somehow restores honor to God. Um, but you, I think you've um, given your explanation of that. Um, so with the the justice thing, I, I made the argument earlier to uh, to it, it being like you know a sort of petty thing where I was in school and I had to couldn't wear headphones just because the other kids couldn't wear headphones and concentrate, even though I could concentrate. So it's like. It's like the laws of justice have to be done just because the laws of justice have to be done, not because of a utilitarian thing, just because it's what we have to do sort of thing. Um, So this gets into the justice topic. So in defense of restoration views and God's rightful justice and, you know, the mercy balancing with the just and Christian Christians often claim that there's mercy and there's justice. And these two things are like parallel good qualities that God has. And so there's a tension between them. And this means that, you know, there's the reaction that's due to us and then there's the mercy and God somehow balances those out with the atonement of Jesus. Whereas uh, coming from an Eastern perspective, uh, I would argue that justice is a secondary good, that we follow the system because it's beneficial. And if there's a point where it's not beneficial, we can step outside of it and step back in again later, uh, just like violating the laws of physics to heal somebody of an illness. Um, so, yeah, justice is a secondary good, which means... It facilitates a higher good. It's not that like God has to punish us because he has to punish us because that's his justice. It's that when there's consequences for our actions, we learn and grow 
and in an environment where where we we enjoy and suffer the consequences of our actions we we learn to become good moral agents and make good decisions and interact with the world in mature ways and if we don't have consequences of our action that doesn't happen however there are certain cases where we've learned the lesson and the consequence can be removed because we no longer need that reaction we've already got the benefit that that reaction would bring so that reaction is no longer beneficial and it can simply be removed Yeah, I think um, there's another piece that needs to be brought in here that I brought up at the beginning and as part of the background for a full atonement theory that um, uh, I think this partially addresses what you're getting after. And that is that uh, Christ um, in this life, we're told that um, He, uh, he became like us, except or without sin. He was, in, insofar as he was a human being in his incarnation, he uh, lived a perfect holy life. He accrued righteousness, according to Hebrews. Um, in Hebrews 4, he became a, like us in every way without sin. There's something about the excruciating death um, that is at least simil similarly, reflects the, the curse, the general curse that he's already assumed, um, that I think is would be missing on accounts that would suggest that there's some sort of moral, uh, there's, there's some sort of moral problem with him experiencing an excruciating death. If he does not, if he doesn't do that, then he, he, I mean, there's an ar arguably he's not be really becoming like us in every way, and he's not able to become. Um, maybe he's 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 not able to experience all the experiences that we do as a human being. Um, so I I think um, I think that needs to be kept in mind when we think about um, perfect righteousness on display. In Christianity, and this is where this is where uh, Christianity is superior to other religions. We have a perfect righteousness on display in the per in, in a person and in made flesh and blood that isn't on display in any other religion, and that's where the particularity of Christ's in uh, the incarnation and his resurrection. His death and resurrection becomes abundantly uh, manifest, you might say, in a way that other religions just can't accommodate. Um, I mean, they can they can go the explicitly mystical route, saying that there's some sort of consciousness that we need to arrive at, but they but they don't have any sort of concrete representation of what righteousness, holiness, honor uh, looks like. So other they traditions have, no, have have they have no sacrifice. prophets or incarnations of God who came down and lived a perfectly righteous life. Had there been other prophets that have lived a righteous life? I mean, I would, I would say Srila Prabhupada, who's the founder of the Hare Krishna movement in the left in the in the West, lived a perfectly righteous life. That. Was, was a perfect example. Yeah. So, so we have this idea in our tradition, we have the word acharya, and acharya uh, has the word uh, char, which is action or behavior. So the acharya is someone who teaches by, by, by action. Uh, they, uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, one, another, one of the acharyas in our tradition, who just means like, like a church father, you might say, who, uh, or prophet, he said, um, you should preach always, and sometimes you should open your mouth. So... Preaching really means embodying the teachings. And we do have examples. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur is another example of someone who lived an exceptional life. Uh, he, 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 yeah, you're, you're supposed to only eat offered food uh, for, that's first been offered by the Lord. And when he was four years old, he ate a mango before it had been offered to God. And his father pointed it out to them. So he atoned for that, to use the word, uh, by never eating a mango again for the rest of his life. This, this was how 
immaculate he was in, in his application of the philosophy. And of course, he's four, four years old. You don't need to do that kind of thing. And also, he's exceptionally intelligent, but, but that's unrelated. So we, we do have cases of special personalities. And then we believe Sri Chaitanya, who appeared 500 years ago, was God incarnate. Uh, 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 incarnation is not actually a, an accurate term because we don't think God takes on flesh. God God appears in his original spiritual form. So it, we, he's an avatar of God, to be precise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I think that so so the 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 important philosophical point there that Christianity makes that is different that that is that is not um, explicitly um, reflected in Platonism or Aristotelianism or um, uh, any of the Eastern philosophies is that. There is a real sense in which the sun truly is both human and divine. And um, it's that revelation um, when it says in John 118, he was the Logos, uh, it is the Logos and he took on human flesh. What is meant by that is he meant. Um, more than, um, more than he's um, he's an avatar. He actually um, steps down in a cos in a sort of cosmological frame of the medieval perspective. He steps down from his hierarchy, and he becomes one of us in a true sense, in a real sense, so that we can be united with God Himself. Something that is not befitting of of of, of serfs, right? So there's something profoundly philosophical about the Christian uh, revelation that is uh, that 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 um, that is otherwise missing but is arguably confirmed at the resurrection where uh, you have this unique event where this human being truly died and then becomes raised uh, is raised from the dead that's the defining sort of warrant or justification for um, the revelatory claim that human beings or that the divine became human in a true sense. And it's through that lens that we begin to understand really and truly what it means to be human. And that's something that's, um, and this is what the early church was so on about, about sort of repudiating was precisely these ideas about God incarnate that were um, treated the, the incarnation as merely sort of spiritual mirages or um, as, um, as a, a sort of, as a kind of assuming a spacesuit or something like that. The flesh was merely a, 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 an assumption of a, a, of a flesh suit rather than the assumption of a truly human nature. Um, if, if the early church fathers were right, reflecting the teachings of scripture, that, um, God became one of us so that we could become God and that, um, that is a necessary requirement Then every other religion, at least insofar as, um, Metaphysically, they're metaphysically bankrupt in terms of salvation. Uh, if the early church fathers are right, reflecting the teachings of scripture, that the incarnate Lagos is a necessary condition for salvation. Uh, this is the truly distinctive claim of Christianity, and that's where the that's where the that that's real really where the dis discussion is and the contribution. I think, yeah. So one way I could reply to that is, is it sounds like that's dependent on several Christian metaphysical assumptions. So it's like you hold this worldview where you need this Christian idea in order to solve it. And then you claim that you're solving something that our religions aren't solving, but you've kind of created the problem through the metaphysical physical assumptions you started in the first place. Uh, when you have different metaphysical assumptions, then that problem doesn't arise, and then you don't need that Christian solution. You can have a different solution, or maybe the problem doesn't even exist at all. For example, like the 
the Vaishnava understanding from Vedanta uh, is yeah, Vaishnava is a synonym for Hare Krishna is that um, we are w- the same in quality as God. We're, we're tiny sparks of the divine, but we're different in quantity. So God is satchit and under eternity, knowledge and bliss, and we're also eternal, full of knowledge and blissful, but we're covered over by the material energy. So because we're tiny, we can become covered over. Um, and we also have this, so we, we're one with God in the sense that we're made out of the same substance. We're of the same quality as God and we're God's parts and parcels. Um, uh, we're different from God in that we're tiny and we can become covered over by bad qualities in the heart and become distracted from by the material energy and chase after things and try to enjoy separate from God. Uh, and also there's this, so the, the pure devotee who descends from the spiritual world, the Sanskrit term is nitya siddha, uh, they can fully display... The, um, they can be completely free from all material bad qualities in the heart. They, they can live a fully righteous life. So they, when they come down, uh, perhaps you could say God can suffer through them or so to speak, or like that the pure devotee can still go through hardship and their efforts to preach. Of course, they're not suffering. You know, we can get into divine simplicity. Uh, what is it? Problems of God being impassable and stuff. They're, they're not suffering in the way we suffer because they're, they're full of, emotions of compassion and so on but they, they, they still go through difficulty and we can have bhakti influence theory or moral influence theory about the difficulty that the acharya goes through and sharing this knowledge and expressing their compassion and trying to save the fallen conditioned souls so when you get to, when you take on different metaphysical assumptions that problem doesn't come up <clears throat> yeah so insofar as um Yeah, so insofar as you um, you are able to confront and reject uh, the implications of the resurrection. Uh, yeah, I mean, so we can talk about different metaphysical assumptions that um, lead different directions. I think in the Christian system, the, the Christian metaphysic is um, is wrapped up in a way that um, I guess the important point is is that the resurrection um, confirms the original revelation at the incarnation in a way that is uh, revelatory of God and his how he relates to his creation in a unique way in contrast to um, other religious perspectives or philosophical perspectives. So um, I think the the public part of Christianity that is universally available or um, available in a way that we can access it and we can see and determine whether or not Christianity is true is uh, certainly in... in uh, we can, we can point to certain miracles and we can point to the life and teachings of Jesus and how perfect he is and how unique his teachings were, et cetera, et cetera. We could point to the incarnation and um, how unique that is in, in contrast to other incarnations that are avatar incarnations. But I think the, the um, decisive evidence, the evidential import that confirms the metaphysical assumptions of the Christian religion would be the resurrection. And so that's the whole um, hope of the Christian. That's the whole um, rationale for how we it is we understand the particularities of the atonement and what that leads to uh, in terms of the mechanism of what that does. Uh, but that's the ultimate hope. That's the whole point. And that's also the evidential um, import of Christianity that's unique in terms of, and you might say metaphysically unique as well. The resurrection is metaphysically unique compared to other religious systems in the world. So we have in our tradition stories of people rising from the dead. So, I mean, we don't have the kind of evidence you have for the the resurrection of Jesus, but that's simply because it didn't mean much to people in India. People were, people were used to yogis having mystical cities and people walking on water and being able to do various mystical things. It, it, It wasn't special. What, what was considered special in our tradition was, bhakti pure love of god and the ability to spread that to other people but someone rising from the dead wasn't that important so people didn't talk about it that much but there are recorded cases of it 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So there. I guess there's there's a further question about um, the evidential import of those resurrections, the nature of those resurrections, particularly uh, who was who was the agent respond responsible for the resurrections. Was it someone else resurrecting them, or were they were they resurrecting themselves by their own agency and power? And that's, um, I think, that seems to be the unique, exclusive, unique, unique, exclusive to the Christian revelation. Yeah, right. Um, we're we're nearly at two hours. There was one more point I wanted to make, which was. Uh, I wrote down the historical problem. So if Jesus appeared 2,000 years ago to save everybody, what, so, I mean, I guess this kind of ties into the Christian idea of the eschaton, right? That everybody is sort of uh, sleeping or on pause or in hibernation or something until heaven on earth gets restored and then they all get resurrected in material bodies similar to the ones they left behind or something like that. So, you know, a good Christian 3,000 years ago, or a good Jew, I guess it would be, dedicated to God, lived a pure life or whatever a good devotee of God was supposed to do at that time in order to be situated to get the mercy and get salvation. But Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet, so are they screwed? What happens? Uh, no, the Old Testament saints are not screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so Their does- revelation is in is anticipatory of of the um the messiah come right so they have to wait around for jesus to come and save them and then they have to wait around a bit more for the restoration of the kingdom of heaven on earth to take place well yeah that you're opening up a different can of worms <laughs> Sorry, yeah. the, i mean it's tied into the uh, resurrection thing and atonement but yeah uh we we can leave yeah, that yeah. for another another episode yes that's good yeah okay cool so i really enjoyed that discussion um we, we got really deep into Appreciate some it. of the philosophy uh was was there anything you, else you wanted to say in defense of your points or in re- relation to my objections or the metaphysics i've put forward well i i, I would just say that um in terms of the atonement i i, I don't see uh i don't see any sort of at least the way that i've defined atonement or developed the theory of the atonement. I don't see any sort of um, entailments to a sort of um, vengeful, psychologically unstable, uh, capricious God picture as being entailed from the uh, the atonement picture that I've, I've given or laid out. And, um, I, and I do see one. I do th- I, yeah, I think you, you do, but I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's compelling. Um, it might be contel- compelling for some um, variations of the atonement, like the Christosodium version that I put uh, yeah. forward. But for my theory, I think it, um, it, it, it. I don't think it entails that. But but it may still. Uh, we may not have resolved the uh, further tension between justice and mercy on that theory, other than to say that um, justice will be upheld. And both mercy and justice are upheld in the death and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ in a way that is is perfect, um, and, um, and 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 so um, there's been no defeaters for um, why God would be unjust on the picture that I put forward, where Christ um, provides uh, salvation. To all people, uh, there, there's, there's no, um, there's no contradiction there, in terms of justice and mercy that is that is displayed. We didn't get into the afterlife and and um, the, the nature of God's grace as being optimal, but um, I think there's ways to. Um, I, there, I mean, I think those those are perfectly compatible with the fear that Joe and I put forward. Yeah, we could definitely go deeper on lots of different subjects. Um, Slam RN was saying we've been waiting 13.8 billion years to even get born. 
but it's a bit different on the Harry Krishna view because we've been incarnating endlessly and on a journey the whole time of elevating our consciousness and removing the dirt from our heart and developing a pure love of God. And so we haven't been waiting on, on the Christian idea. You could say you haven't been waiting. You didn't even exist. You were just created right now for this one life. Yeah. Um, something else I was going to say that I've lost it. So, oh yeah. And Slam RN had another question from earlier on, which was if, um, if beings live forever, even a little sin would get magnified. Uh, so this is a question for you. Do, do you think about this? I think what she's saying is if, if we live forever and we were just committing a minute amount of sin the whole time we were living, we, and we we're not burning through it. We're not burning through our, our sin or karma. Eventually we'd have an infinite amount of sin. Well, okay, that's that's a that's a that's a big question. Um, so uh, that opens up a different can of worms. Um, uh, there's a few different responses to that. One is uh, whether or not you hold to a, an eternal view of hell as as the place where sinfulness uh, uh, is present forever. The other, view, um, so you might be a conditionalist or an annihilationist and say that we uh, sinners just go out of existence. Um, but certainly, I don't think that's a traditional view, and I don't think it's right. But um, that is one route that you could go as a Christian to uh, sort of dissolve that objection. One, another is simply just to say that uh, we, need to, we need to have two different conceptualities of, of what is meant by infinite. Um, there's infinite in duration ongoing sense, of which there is an ongoing punishment that, that is ensued consequentially, and there is another sense of infinite. There is no sense in which corruption can be infinite in itself if we take sort of an Augustinian privation view that um, that badness or corruption always depends upon something that's good. So it's the very goodness of God that is actually sustaining sinful people in, ex in, in ongoing existence. And the fact that they're existing forever is actually... Um, actually represents or reflects God's goodness toward them in some underlying way. I think you're on mute. One last question. If I've looked at Christianity and I've looked at the Bhagavatam and the Bhagavatam just seems to be a higher divine revelation to me than the Bible and I'm following it, trying to dedicate my life to God, trying to rectify my rebellion against God and fix the relationship with God and uh, doing the best I can in that regard. Uh, am I screwed because I didn't accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Or will God accept my sincerity, you know, accept my intentions and make up the difference? Like there's a quote in Bhagavad Gita where, where Krishna says, For, uh, to those who are dedicated to serving me, I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. Hmm. Yeah, so there's a there's a healthy respect of of, of, of pagans within the Christian tradition, um, uh, a healthy respect and honor for pagans as being at least in a societal sense and a common sense they can be good. Um, there's, but that's just as a side note, that. paganism is Mediterranean Hinduism. A little. Oh, interesting historical point. Yeah, I, I'm using. I, I'm sorry. I'm using Christianese there. Pagan. I, I'm just using as as a reference for for those who are um, uh, not recipients of, of the Christian revelation. Right. Right. More generically, um, um, there's a healthy respect for pagans as as having a lot to offer and being commonly or societally good in many ways and even better than many of the Christians in some ways. Um, but I would say that, um, yeah, so in answering that question, are they screwed? Um, I would just say that, well, with any system, and I think if we're going to be honest at some point, at least in this life, with any system, there is going to be at some level, at some abstract level, there is going to be an exclusiveness. Um, and within the Christian religion, there is some kind of exclusiveness, at least in the personal work of Jesus Christ, as the um, the one who lived a perfect life, died, and was resurrected. There is an exclusivity there. Um, 
I don't know if people are screwed because I don't know what to make of, of, of the afterlife and whether or not, as somebody who affirms some kind of purgatory, if God's optimal love is, is, um, is uh, hypothetically possible to access or appropriate uh, by an unbelieving pagan in the next life. It may be, in which case that would sort of um, that would sort of do a lot of the work that your reincarnation view does. So if I'm a, there's a funny story of um, some Hare Krishnas who are Americans in India and they were going around spreading Krishna consciousness and there were some more traditional Indians who think, you, you know, the it's, it's birth based, you have to take birth in India. And they think if you're good Hare Krishnas in this life, in your next birth, you can take birth. And in, in an Indian body as a Brahmin, and Prabhupada told, told them, "You should what you should say to those Brahmins is, if you're good Brahmins in this life, in your next life, you can take birth in America as a Hare Krishna." Um, so related to that, it's kind of like what you're saying here could could be interpreted or stretched as saying, "If I'm a good Hare Krishna in this life, God, then God will be merciful upon me, and in my next life, I can take birth in a nice Christian family and get the real mercy." Except you don't believe in reincarnation, so of course it's another kind of purgatory. Yeah. I'm kind of just making a yeah. joke. Yeah, no, I get you. You're being funny a little bit. But I, I mean, I think the benefits are there. I, I, I wouldn't stretch it that far to reincarnation. There are some Christians who believe in that, although I think they're violating pretty clear teachings of Scripture and uh, pretty clear teachings of the tradition, dogmatically speaking. But um, I think, yeah, I think I, I get your point. I think I, I find it humorous, but also I find some some truth in it. I think there, I think the benefits of pur purgatory, if it ends up being true, and God's optimal love is able to be accessed by way of uh, unbelieving, you know, pagans or fairy Krishnas in the next life, then I think um, I think it could solve some of the, it could de deflate some of the um, sort of the concerns that you've been raising about um, the income compatibility of God's love and or mercy and justice and those sorts of issues. I think it does. It has this similar benefits in other words. Yeah. Yeah. So it achieves the same purpose via a different mechanism, which is compatible yeah. with Christian hermeneutics. Yes. I think it is. Yeah. I mean, some would debate. I, I think it is. Yeah. All right. Cool. Let's, I let's, have to admit it, but yeah, let's wrap it up there. Uh, that was a great discussion. And we, I, I had a deep discussion with Lucas uh, the other day on uh, Christian exclusivism, so we went pretty deep in that topic. He was also very philosophical, so that, that was a good discussion, which goes deeper into the topic we just broached right now. So if you find this interesting, you can head over there and see, watch that one. And uh, thanks again for coming on, Josh. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. It was a fun discussion. Cool. So uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, if you like this sort of stuff, be sure to subscribe so you can catch more of it. Uh, let us know what you think down in the comments. Um, I, I, I will interact with the comments. I can't really interact in the live chat so much because I have to concentrate. And I'll see you in the next one. Hare Krishna.